Is Lightning Returns worth playing in 2023? Yes, but only for certain individuals. Let me explain. Lightning Returns is the end of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, and oh boy does it take a significant departure from the rest of the trilogy. And I don't think that this is a bad thing, or necessarily a good thing either. Really the only thing that gets carried over from the other titles are the characters and the story, to some extent. This is interesting, but also a letdown in a lot of ways because I really enjoyed Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII too. And if you were hoping this game would be more of that, with maybe just some small changes and improvements, I think you'll be let down by this game as well. However, this is still a good game. And if you're interested in Final Fantasy XIII and the world that it's built, you should probably check this one out. The plot. So this is the end of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. So in order to talk about this story, I'm going to have to talk about the story of Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII II. If you don't want to know any of that information, or if you want to see what I thought about Final Fantasy XIII or XIII II, click off this video or go check out my other videos in the links in the description. With that said, let's get into it. So Lightning Return starts off 500 years after the events at the end of Final Fantasy XIII 2. So let's do a quick summary of the events of the end of Final Fantasy XIII 2. Sarah dies, the chaos is spreading throughout the entire world due to the goddess Etro dying, Lightning goes back into a crystal slumber, and essentially Caius, the main villain, wins. And the game literally ends with a to be continued screen. I thought this was a really good ending for Final Fantasy XIII 2, and I was really excited for the follow-up to this game, and I thought that the game pretty much told you what was going to happen from the beginning, and then it did happen. It just didn't seem like it was going to happen typically because the good guys win. But Lightning Returns takes place 500 years after these events, and the world, the lore, and the rules have all changed from the previous game. Lightning is awoken by God, aka Bunavelza. She's tasked with saving as many souls as she can for the creation of a new world by Bunavelza and the destruction of the previous world due to the chaos being out of control. And if she does this, God will bring Sarah back to life. However, once the chaos was released into the world at the end of Final Fantasy XIII 2, several areas of this world were destroyed and millions of people were not alive. So now the world of Lightning Returns has all new areas that formed from the remnants of the previous world, which was already a world several hundred years in the future for Lightning and Friends from Final Fantasy XIII. So this new world Lightning Returns is very novel from the original world of Final Fantasy XIII. For the people that survived the unleashing of the chaos, they noticed that they no longer aged or died of old age. So that meant that people that were children at the time of the releasing of the chaos were still children 500 years later when Lightning Returns takes place. Same goes for elderly people and for middle-aged people. Yet people still do die here, but they die through illnesses and any mortal wounds or incidences. But so many things are off with this whole setup from the beginning, and along with the player, Lightning senses this too. So overall, it's a very interesting plot, but man what a departure this is from the previous title, and from Final Fantasy XIII in that matter. Final Fantasy XIII 2 felt like a spin-off of Final Fantasy XIII. But I think that Final Fantasy XIII 2 did it really well and set up the plot to tell a more intimate story that evolves into a more grandiose blockbuster experience. But Lightning Returns feels like a spin-off of a spin-off, for the sake of being a spin-off. I'll elaborate. At the end of Final Fantasy XIII 2, it seems as if Kais is going to continue to be the main villain for the next game, or something of that nature. It definitely seemed as if the story with Kais was not finished. And to be fair, it isn't. And it is explored in this game in a fun way, but not nearly as impactful as having him play a primary role in the story. But instead of having Kais as the main villain in this game, we have a completely new main villain that has never been talked about prior to the previous two entries. Along with this, a completely new set of lore that interlinks with the prior games has been established, but again has never been discussed prior to this game. Final Fantasy XIII 2 kind of did this with Final Fantasy XIII story and lore, but it made sense and it was the first time that this was done, and assumedly it was done to lead into the conclusion of the trilogy. This game, Lightning Returns. And it kind of does, but most of the story and the lore of the world of Lightning Returns is brand new and it only ties into the world and the lore of the previous games ever so slightly. I don't hate this or love this. I think that the lore of Final Fantasy XIII is phenomenal and would have loved to see that expanded upon because there's so many mysteries about there. And Final Fantasy XIII 2 kind of does this, but again it more so adds new story elements and completely new lore that only ties in with the Final Fantasy XIII story and lore. And Lightning Returns does this exact same thing to the world in the lore of Final Fantasy XIII 2. And again, I not only think that Final Fantasy XIII 2 did it better than Lightning Returns, but since Lightning Returns does it to the lore and the story of Final Fantasy XIII 2, it feels like we're so far removed from the original lore and story of Final Fantasy XIII that Lightning Returns is only the conclusion to the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy by way of name and characters. But speaking of the characters, let's talk about the characters. The characters. All of the main characters from this game are all returning characters from the previous two games, with the only exception being the main villain and a new character named Lumina. I don't want to give the identity of the main villain away because it's definitely a spoiler, but overall the main villain is pretty good. I don't really like the inclusion of the main villain from a plot perspective, but they did a good job with them, and they are voice acted very well, and their motivations and scenarios that they put them in are well acted and done. Lumina is basically the menace of the game. She makes the journey more difficult for Lightning and apparently has been tormenting Snow for a while while Lightning was in her crystal slumber. But she also gives Lightning more information about what's really going on here. But the question is, can Lightning trust her? 
Also, a couple other questions that immediately pop up are, what is she, and why does she look so similar to Sarah? This is super interesting, and I think she's done well. Her voice acting's great, she's very energetic and mischievous, but in a fun way, not really an evil way. And of course, there's a great bit of mystery that surrounds her, and naturally you question if you can trust her, and if she's a villain or an ally, or neither. As far as the rest of the characters go, they're all returning characters from the prior games, as previously stated. So the question to ask here is not really what do I think about these characters, it's more so how are these characters represented in Lightning Returns. So let's start with the main character. Lightning. Lightning is the same Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII 2. And to me, this is a good thing. She's a stoic badass that only shows emotion during important sections. Lightning is represented very well in Lightning Returns, and right by her side, or more so the voice in her ear, is Hope. Hope in Lightning Returns is represented very well alongside Lightning. However, this is basically the hope at the end of Final Fantasy XIII and not the hope at the end of Final Fantasy XIII 2, which initially seems like a very strange choice, but it surprisingly works very well. Hope is a voice acted very well, and his character in this plot makes a lot of sense and is just overall very well done. Well, he maybe talks to you a little bit too much in game, and too often. Another central character in this game is Snow, surprisingly. And really, this is the biggest surprise of the game. But Snow not only is done very well, but he's also likable, which is a lot coming from me. Snow in Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII 2 is a very generic good guy that is tough, but throughout those games you find out that he's really not so tough and he has a soft side to him. He's more so playing the hero character and not actually being one in the prior two games. He's also absolutely ignorant about assessing others' emotions and true intentions. However, here in Lightning Returns, almost all of this is not present. Now that ever once optimistic Snow is gone and is replaced by a wallowing, self-hating Snow, he feels the full weight of his failures, finally and he's more in tune with the people and the world around him. This shift in character is wonderful, and does so much for the story. They essentially take the most optimistic character from the last two games and destroy him with the despair of his own failures that led to the hardship that they now all live in, the end of all things. He's completely broken, and now it's Lightning's job to save him if she can, if he's not already too far gone. Snow is wonderfully done in this game, but you know who's not? Saz. They just keep doing Saz dirty. Saz is barely in this game, and it's a very uninteresting version of him at that. Here he's mad about his circumstances, which is understandable. I don't really want to give those away because that's kind of a spoiler. But he basically stays that way until you fix his circumstances. And he doesn't show up for a long while after you fix him. And even when he does show up later, it's for a very short time and adds nothing to the story. It's essentially a cameo. Saz was so cool in Final Fantasy XIII, and even there I don't think it was handled properly. And he was handled much worse in Final Fantasy XIII 2, and even worse here. This is really disappointing, and I'm sad this is how they handled Saz for the finale of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. Other characters that were handled rather poorly, but not as poorly as Saz in my opinion, were Noel and Vanille. I think Noel in this game is in this game for the right amount of time, lengthwise, but what he is in this game and his motivations betray his character from Final Fantasy XIII 2. Noel from Final Fantasy XIII 2 is an excellent character, and I would have loved to see a continuation of that Noel in this game, but unfortunately, we get a contrived Noel that is more here to advance the plotline and for the necessity of inclusion due to him being one of the main characters of the previous game. Vanille is essentially represented in the same way as Noel is. Her character is arguably the same from the previous two games, but I think her actions and Lightning Returns portrays her as being significantly more dumb, but this is definitely arguable. Personally, I did not like or dislike her inclusion in this game, and honestly I feel the same way about Noel. And for me, this is the worst place to be in. This ambivalent area. This is essentially the mid section. I wish they would have done more with these characters. But you know which returning character they handled really, really well in Lightning Returns? Fang. Fang Boon of Elza, they did Fang well. Fang essentially has her own section in this game, and it's done very, very well. And again, she's in this game for just the right amount of time lengthwise. Fang is still the same Fang from the prior two games, and that's exactly what I wanted. I'm so happy how they brought her back, and I think she's been done well here, just as well as she's been done throughout the trilogy. Which is great. I was really stoked that she was in here as much as she is. And that's about it for the main characters of this game. However, there is a massive amount of side characters that are in the various areas that you travel to throughout the game, and that give you side quests, or just give you general information. There's so many of these characters that it's truly just a hit or miss whether these characters are voice acted well or if their lines are good or not. And I'd say it's about an equal split of great to not so great characters and performances. But for nearly all the side characters, I think they all talk too much. There's essentially too much dialogue in this game. And Lightning engages with them for conversation way too long as well. Some of the stories in the side content are very interesting, but there's so much dialogue that so much of it is just fluff. And I quickly became disinterested in giving these conversations my full attention. And even towards the latter half of the game, where I kind of had the story figured out, I would skip these dialogue altogether if I didn't find them interesting. Don't get me wrong, some of these interactions are worth your time, or either very informative, or just fun. But as a whole, it's just too much fluff for me. But you know what didn't get enough fluff? The soundtrack and visuals. So let's start off with the soundtrack. 
I felt like there was no real new songs that were noticeable during my playthrough of Lightning Returns. However, when my curiosity got the best of me and I looked up the soundtrack as a whole on YouTube, there's a lot of tracks that are pretty good and they're somewhat new because they're remixes of old tracks. But besides the arc music and the battle theme, I really didn't notice any of these throughout my playthrough. I felt like most of the music throughout my playthrough were either songs from Final Fantasy XIII or Final Fantasy XIII 2 that were remixed for this game. So because of that, I felt like the soundtrack to Lightning Returns was overall pretty disappointing. But the official soundtrack is pretty solid. I'd still say it's not better than Final Fantasy XIII or Final Fantasy XIII 2s, but it's not a bad soundtrack. I just wish I could have noticed more of it in the game. So let's move on from that and talk about the visuals. Final Fantasy XIII and XIII 2 look wonderful still to this day, and while Lightning Returns is a slight downgrade from these previous two titles, I still think it looks really good overall. Almost all cutscenes are in-game cutscenes, with the exception of the intro and the outro of the game being cinematic cutscenes. The prior two games had significantly more cinematic cutscenes, with Final Fantasy XIII having the most. But the question is, why is this the case? Especially since all three games were made in the same engine. All three games in the trilogy were made in the Crystal Tools engine. This is an engine that had to be created at least two years prior to the launch of Final Fantasy XIII, which was in 2009. So more than likely this engine is at least six to seven years plus in age by the time that Lightning Returns was released. By no means does this amount of time insinuate that the engine is no longer viable, because there's always upgrades that could be done that can make an engine run for decades. However, it is telling that Lightning Returns is the last game that was made on this engine. But my whole point with this is that this specific game had limitations that could be seen all the way back to the first game in the trilogy when they launched Final Fantasy XIII. And I think that this explains why Lightning Returns looks the way it does. Final Fantasy XIII still looks great to this day, but one of the main issues with this game is its linearity, which could very well be a limitation of the Crystal Tools engine. It could have also been due to the rush development. However, Final Fantasy XIII 2 was not rushed, and in fact, there were outside studios that joined Square Enix to help with the development. XIII 2 had significantly more diverse and open worlds than Final Fantasy XIII did, and it looked just as good as that game but there was a lot of lag throughout that game. So assumedly, by making a bigger world and more worlds to explore in general, and adding all the extra features that 13.2 did, in order to keep the same visual clarity from the previous game, Final Fantasy 13, 13.2's performance had to suffer due to the limitations of the Crystal Tool engines, assumedly. Thankfully, there's no lag in Lightning Returns, or at least on the Xbox platform there isn't. And there is so much more going on in Lightning Returns when you compare it to the other two games with the open area designs and the various NPCs. So how is it then that Lightning Returns is bigger in every way and has better performance than 13.2 did? Well, I think they let the game take a hit on the visuals in order to achieve this. Overall, Lightning Returns still looks good, but it's disappointing that it just doesn't look as good as the other two games in the trilogy. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk about some weird stuff. The gameplay, the non-battle system gameplay. Lightning Returns is Final Fantasy meets Majora's Mask, with a little bit of Dark Souls sprinkled in there. And it's done alright, so your goal throughout the game is to complete 5 main quests within a time limit of initially 6 days, where every minute in the game is approximately 2.5 seconds in real time. Every morning at 6am in the game, you get transported back to a hub world called the Ark. You then can teleport yourself down to one of the open areas that you've already unlocked, and start the cycle all over again. You can potentially get time back by saving more souls, and by doing side quests throughout each open area, and in total there are 4 open areas that can be unlocked from the beginning of the game, and each area has a main quest tied to it, with one area having two main quests tied to it. Lightning also levels up by completing those quests, both main quest and side quests. Each quest is different from the next. You do still have your simple fetch quests and hunt quests, but some get really weird and abstract. I don't want to talk too much about the different quests, because that kind of leads into spoiler territory again. Some of these quests get really, really weird. So let's talk about the open areas. Again, there are four open areas, and they can be unlocked after completing the first part of the main quest. These areas are Luxarion, Yusanan, the Wildlands, and the Dead Dunes. Luxarion is a holy city that more resembles a downtown area of a dark major metropolitan area from the world of Final Fantasy 13, and is the first area that you start off in after the intro section. You can then unlock Usanon, which is also an area that resembles a major metropolitan area, but it's a bright sin city and not a holy city. The Wildlands is the next area that you unlock, and is a vast open Greenland area. And then finally, the Dead Dunes is the last area that you unlock, and it resembles more so of a desert. I like all of these areas, and I think they make for very interesting places for you to visit throughout your journey. You know what else you'll be doing throughout your journey? Battling. The battle system. So Final Fantasy XIII 2 makes innovations to the Final Fantasy XIII battle formula, and it changes up some things for the better, but also keeps a lot the same. Lightning Returns throws all that out the window and has a completely new battle system. The reason that they do this is because you only ever play as Lightning. And again, this is something that I don't personally love or hate. I really enjoyed the battle system of the previous game and would have loved to have more of that. But this new system is also very good and interesting as a whole, and it was also fun. So what's this new battle system all about? Well, it somewhat mirrors the prior battle systems of Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII 2, but it puts a lot more emphasis on being 
being fast and reactive and exploiting enemy weaknesses. Again, you only ever play as lightning in this battle system, but you can have three skamatas that you can cycle through. The skamatas essentially act like other party members. You can only control one skamata at a time, but you can switch between all three in an instant freely. Each Kamada has a garb, which is the outfit that Lightning wears, a weapon, a shield, four commands, two accessory slots, and an adornment slot. The accessories that you can equip on these Kamadas act the same way as they did in Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII II, with each accessory giving out unique increases in stats or passive abilities. The adornments act just like they did in Final Fantasy XIII II, where it's simply cosmetic. The garb, the weapon, and the shield affect stats, which are the same main stats that Lightning had from the prior two games, which are Strength, Magic, HP, and ATB. The garb can also have passive abilities that affect your stats as well. For example, a garb can have a passive ability of Lightning starting off with 50% of the ATB gauge filled at the beginning of the battle, but having 50% more ATB overall. Lightning's overall stats are independent of the Skamata, but the Skamatas can dramatically affect the vitality of the overall stats within that setup. So for instance, some garbs, weapons, and shields, and accessories can increase Lightning's HP by several hundred points, but that is points added to the baseline of Lightning's overall stats. So if Lightning had a baseline of 2000 HP, HP, and she put on a garb that increases her HP by 800 points, then while she's wearing that garb, she has 2,800 HP in total. The garb can also have certain commands locked to that specific garb, which may make it beneficial or detrimental depending on your playstyle or the enemies that you're currently fighting. The weapons and shields also have passive abilities like the garbs, but they're usually not as prominent as a garb's passive abilities. However, the shield has a special stat that's very important called guard defense, which affects how well your shield blocks attacks. Blocking attacks is where that new element of being significantly more reactive the battle system really kicks in in this game, but more on that in a little bit. So how do battles work? To start a battle, you have to encounter an enemy. Enemy encounters are a mixture of the previous two games, where here the encounters are random, but the enemy is placed in a certain area that you walk into. So as you're walking into an area, you will either have enemies in that area or you won't. And if you leave that area and travel far enough, they will disappear. Also like the other two games, the preemptive strike is back. Well, kind of. So how it works in this game is that if you hit an enemy before they notice you by pressing the attack button, which is very similar to how you do in Final Fantasy 13 2, they start the battle off with 25% less health. If you hit them after they notice you, they start off with 10% less health. However, if you get hit by the enemy, you lose 5% of your overall health. And this is a big deal because unlike the previous game, you don't fully heal after every battle. But before I talk about the HP and how the healing works in this game, let me explain how the battle system works proper. When the battle starts, you are in your starting schemata, and you can switch between the other two schematas at any time you want. You have several different commands that you can equip to your schemata that consist of physical attacks, magical attacks, debuffs, and guarding. You can equip up to four of these commands, and you can use them freely as long as you have ATB to execute these commands. Each command will cost you a certain amount of ATB, and once you run out of ATB, you will no longer be able to execute the commands in that schemata until it refills. The schemata that's equipped will refill very slowly. However, if you switch to another schemata, the unequipped schemata will refill much more quickly. So the goal of this is to use your ATB effectively and switch between schematas regularly. The physical and magical attacks and debuffs work very similar to the prior games and each enemy will be affected differently by the type of attack. And this time, each enemy has different types of attacks or elemental weaknesses that will increase or decrease the enemy's staggering point. So some enemies are more likely to be staggered with physical attacks, while some are more likely to be staggered with magical attacks, or even debuffs. The staggering point is represented by a wave present over the enemy's nameplate. The wave increases in frequency and amplitude when the enemy is getting closer to being staggered, and decreases when they're getting further away from being staggered. Once the enemy is staggered, there's either some kind of debuff or moment of stasis that the enemy goes into that is different for each enemy type. Guarding blocks enemies' attacks by a certain percentage for both physical and magical damage, and it can also block debuffs. The various different types of guards all cost a certain amount of ATB. And like attacks, if you don't have enough ATB to execute the block, lightning will not block the attacks. Also, if enemies perform multiple attacks at once, this will more quickly deplete your ATB from the guarding action because it registers as several different blocking commands. Also, also, if you just block before an enemy hits you, you can get a perfect block in, which will either help with staggering the enemy or cost you no ATB for said block, or both. This is a really important mechanic, especially for the late game, because as previously stated, Lightning does not heal after battles. So the HP that she loses after every battle is just gone until she heals. Healing can be done through many different ways, but the main one is going to be through using recovery items, which you can only hold a certain amount of. Initially, you can only hold five. This will increase as you progress through the game. You can also rest at an inn or a hotel in the game, and this will heal Lightning fully, but it costs you time, which as previously explained, is a limited and very valuable resource. 
You can also use an EP ability, but EP points are also very valuable and limited. EP is earned after defeating enemies in battle and is fully refilled after you return to the arc at 6 a.m. every morning. EP allows you to do various different things, with one of them being healing. Some of the other main abilities are overclock, chronostasis, and teleport. Overclock can be used in battle to allow you to unleash a large amount of attacks on an enemy or enemies in a short amount of time for maximum damage output. Chronostasis stops the in-game clock that allows you to prolong your time in whichever area that you're in in order to achieve a task or to complete a certain quest that you're in the middle of. And teleport is pretty self-explanatory. It allows you to teleport to different areas within the game that you've already unlocked within a few seconds, but it costs a significant amount of EP. EP is very interesting, and I think its addition is really cool and it fits with the overall balance of the battle system. So now that we've discussed all the major components of the battle system, the question is, how does this battle system hold up? And the answer is, pretty well. The battles are typically very fun and strategic. The need to exploit enemies' weaknesses is very high and can make the difference between the battle taking a few seconds to win or being completely unbeatable. All the commands that you equip fit into the battle system well, and in general, you can equip all three schemata with different commands to balance out the deficits that you may have in a wide variety of battles. The actual battle does it does kind of feel like a turn-based RPG, but it also feels like an action game that requires you to execute attacks and block incoming enemy attacks at the right time, all while managing the stamina bar and swords. <coughs> Dark Souls. <coughs> Outside of the actual battle, you have more so of a management of lightning and the quests that you are trying to complete while dealing with their health and the time limit. Taking a lot of damage in battle is disadvantageous because you'll have to find a way to heal her, which will cost a valuable resource or two. So the natural question is, why not avoid battles altogether and just complete the quest? Because again, she only ever levels up through the quest. Well, first off, that's very difficult because if you come into close proximity of an enemy, they are very likely to attack you by hitting you in the back or as you pass them, and then you lose 5% of your overall health. Okay, that's fair enough, but why not engage a battle and then leave? Well, in order to leave a battle, you have to use the escape command for zero EP, but you will lose an hour of the end game time, which is a major loss. Also, if you don't defeat enough enemies, you may not have enough of the resources that you need to complete certain quests or obtain certain items or have enough money. So not battling is not practical, but battling enemies you can't beat is also not practical. Having this balance with the questing system and the time management system interlinked with the battle system, I think makes the gameplay overall very interesting and fun. The story, no spoilers. I very much enjoyed the story of Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII too, but I only like the story of Lightning Returns. It's not bad, it's just so far detached from Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII 2, and it's so weird and ethereal that it felt as almost as if it was more of a fan fiction story than the conclusion of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. Most of the story is told through in-game cutscenes, which ranges from being very good to very weird, and this is throughout the whole game. There's definitely some really good moments here, and I don't want to underplay that. However, the real story is mostly about how lightning helps all the inhabitants of this world and saves their souls. And again, this ranges from very brilliant to meh. There's definitely some very interesting things here that give more context to the world and flesh out some of the lore and the story behind some of the main characters as well. But there's definitely some very silly ones, but they're all pretty fun. However, again, the dialogue is way too long and it's just very exhausting. Overall, I like the story, but it just doesn't reach the heights of Final Fantasy 13 or Final Fantasy 13 2. So much of the story is so far out there that it requires you to suspend disbelief pretty much the entire time. And if you do, this is a pretty fun story. The twists and the ending. Major spoilers. So I, I need to talk about the twist and the ending as this really affects my opinions on the game. And since this is the conclusion of the trilogy, I probably won't be able to talk about it anywhere else. So for this section, there's gonna be spoilers. If you don't wanna be spoiled on this, then skip to the timestamp on the screen now. Three, two, one. Okay, so the two main twists here are who the main villain is and who Lumina is. The twist of the main villain is so obvious from the beginning that when it's revealed, it's super underwhelming. Luna Velza was so obviously an evil god from the beginning. However, the fact that Lightning was also considering to betray him, even from the beginning, was a good story choice and in my opinion does fall in line with their character. The reveal of Lumina's true identity, which is Lightning subconscious somehow, that came to life, is just completely out of left field and doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. So for me, both of these were just very underwhelming. So as far as the actual ending goes, mechanically or gameplay wise, the final area is super tough and it's such a huge spiking difficulty. I grinded a lot before entering the final area. And when I say a lot, I mean I completed about 90 to 95% of all the side quests. I also spent a lot of time getting the best equipment by either buying them or grinding them out through killing the Omega versions of the monsters that drop these weapons like the Skeleton and the Reaver. I even acquired some of the strongest commands in the game by unlocking the extra day and fighting through the new floors of the ultimate layer. And even with all this, I still struggled to get through the final area. I also tried to get the ultimate weapon and the ultimate shield by completing the trials in the room adjacent to the final boss which requires you to complete five of these trials and I couldn't even make it through the first one. 
And you know, on top of that, oh my god, the final boss, Bunavelza, is so hard. It was more like fighting Melania from Elden Ring. Bunavelza has four phases, each one of them having different mechanics and different requirements for staggering Bunavelza and defeating said phase. It took me five tries to beat this guy, and it required all ten of my healing items, all eight of my AP points, and when I finally beat him, I was on the edge of being not alive. Through this fight, guarding and attacking at the right time by learning the various attacks and learning the timing of this fight, was absolutely necessary because really you can only make a handful of mistakes before the run's ruined. After the third failed run, I legitimately thought about not completing this, but I'm glad that I stuck to it and ended up beating them and finished it out. But the question that I had is, what do you do if you truly get stuck here? This is the final boss. So is there any way that you can grind to more easily beat the final boss? No, that's not an option. You essentially have to get good. The only option here is to either get the Ultima weapon and the Ultima shield, along with some of the top tier commands in the five trials before entering the final boss fight. Or there's another option that's very dramatic and tragic, and that option is to restart your journey, but keep all your equipment and stats with the exception of the key item. It took me about 30 hours to reach the final boss. I cannot imagine doing another 30 hours of the exact same thing that I just did, just so I can beat the final boss. This game does have a difficulty setting, and initially you can choose between easy and normal. I chose normal, so I guess you could avoid this by playing on easy, but you cannot change this difficulty setting once you start the game. And lowering the difficulty setting at the very end of the game to beat the game is not how the game should be designed anyway. Nor should you have to play the game all over again in order to level up more and obtain better items in order to beat the final boss. I absolutely agree with having a very tough final boss fight, but there has to be ways to level up or get better equipment in order to beat the final boss that doesn't require you to start a 30 hour game over again. As far as the ending goes, story-wise, this is so crazy and over the top that while visually looks super cool and very fun, it makes very little sense and I'm not quite sure exactly what happened, especially with the post credit cutscene, which apparently is locked to unlocking the extra day. But if I had to summarize it, I think that Lightning and Friends beat Bunavelza with the power of friendship, aka all of their powers put together. Sarah comes back to life. Kai sacrifices himself to contain the chaos so that Yule can live a normal life with Noel. And there also seems to be a romantic connection with Yule and Noel that wasn't really emphasized in the previous game, which feels a little strange. The current world is then destroyed. All the souls throughout all of time in the Final Fantasy XIII universe are then saved and transported to a new world to assumedly live happily ever after. And finally, with the post credit scene, we find out that this new world is Earth, and all the events from Final Fantasy XIII to Lightning Returns happened in the past. And somehow the last shot shows lightning alive during our current time on Earth somehow. What a weird, weird, weird way to end this trilogy. Like most things in this game, I don't hate or love this, but specifically with the post credit scene where lightning tells us about this new world that is apparently Earth and all of the events from Final Fantasy 13, 13 2 and Lightning Returns took place in the past, for me is just way too much. It's not bad by any means, but it's just not needed and it changes your whole perception of the world of Final Fantasy XIII, 13, 13 2, and Lightning Returns. And since this is the end of the trilogy, and we're definitely not getting any more games in this universe, it's not going to be followed up upon. So you're just left with so many questions that'll never be answered. I wish they wouldn't have done this, but I will forever remember this game, specifically for just how crazy this was, and if that's what they were trying to do, they definitely did it. Conclusion this is such a weird game to be the conclusion of the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy. The game switches up the formula from the prior two games so much in terms of gameplay and story that it almost feels detached from the trilogy. But as a standalone game, it's pretty good. I really like the combat in the open areas and interacting with the inhabitants of this world, although the dialogue is way too much for pretty much everybody. The time management system is oddly fun and exciting and puts a sense of urgency and importance on what you choose to do with your time. I personally played with a strategy guide and I would highly recommend this owing to the fact that if you want to optimize your time and get items and complete quests within a timely manner and efficiently. This is not the conclusion to the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy that I was expecting, nor was it one that I really wanted. But overall, it was it was solid and it was fun to play. If you're invested in the Final Fantasy XIII universe, then I would recommend playing this game. If you haven't played Final Fantasy XIII or XIII 2, and you want to know what I thought about those games, check out my prior two videos linked in the description or on my channel. In short, I would very much recommend playing Final Fantasy XIII and XIII 2. If you like those games, definitely give Lightning Returns a shot. But if you want to see more like this, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the bell notification. That way you don't miss out on any future videos. And leave a comment, tell me what you thought about this video or what you'd like to see me do next. Thank you for all the support. I really appreciate each and every one of you and I love seeing what you think about the video and your opinions on the game in the comments. I think next up for me is Final Fantasy XV or Final Fantasy X. I really can't decide, I'm, I'm torn between the two. I'm gonna do both, but I just don't know which one to do first. Just let me know what you wanna see next. But until then, I wish you all the very best and I hope you enjoyed. Bye bye.